Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We'll just uh, let uh, our attendees uh, flood in from the waiting room. Uh, thank you for those of you who've uh, joined us already. Uh, some more people coming. Pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar this morning, uh, talking about uh, the limits on train payloads and efforts uh, and work being done to modernise the way that uh, we enable that on the network. Uh, and trying to uh, bring up to date some of the standards which are constraining the productivity of, of freight trains. So welcome to you all. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, just whilst people join, a few bits of housekeeping from me. Uh, for This is our last webinar of the year, and I know many of you have uh, joined previous webinars, so you already know the ropes. But um, if you have got questions, please do pop them in the Q&A box that you've got. Or if you can't see that in the chat, and we will get to as many of those questions as we can later on in the session. Uh, if you wish to have a copy of the slides, please drop Yvonne and myself uh, an email and we will get those over to you after the session. Uh, the video, uh, the webinar is being recorded, so the video will be up on our YouTube channel in the usual fashion uh, probably later this week. So if you've missed it or you want to share the content with any of your colleagues and friends, uh, we'll have that uploaded and you'll be able to see that. Uh, so please do look out for that later in the week. If you can't find it, do just give us a shout. And if you want to know any more about the work, Aaron and Ralph, I'm sure will be pleased to speak to you offline or pick up any questions that we can't get to today. Uh, just a few more notices from me before we start. Um, as I said, this is our last event of the year, literally. Well, we've got our members digital forum this afternoon. That is technically our last event of the year. It's our last webinar of the year. Uh, if any of you on there are keen to present at an event next year, a webinar or a group meeting, we're always looking for interesting topics. So please do get in touch. If you've enjoyed our webinars this year, uh, tell your friends uh, and uh, let's have a think about some interesting topics we can run in 2024. Uh, if you've missed not missed the details, our members party, our first event of next year is on the 30th of January. So please do register for that just so we know how many sandwiches to order. It's in central London at the usual venue. Uh, and if you are interested in our mentoring scheme, we're still open for people to register both as mentees and mentors uh, up until the 5th of January. So if there's people in your teams wanting to sign up, uh, please do do so. OK, uh, that is all the parish notices, so to speak, uh, a good number of people joining us now. So let us uh, move into today's topic and delighted uh, to welcome Aaron Barrett, who is the lead research analyst at RSSB and oversees the freight research programme. And Ralph Goldney, director at Rail Freight Consulting, who are going to be taking us through uh, the presentation today. So, Aaron, thank you very much. I believe you're on first. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks very much, Maggie. Uh, Ralph, are you, are you uh, sharing the screen? Yep. Thank you. Okay, uh, so if you go on to the first slide, thanks, Ralph. So the work that you're about to hear about today uh, comes from a pipeline of research uh, that has been created by the RSSB, informed by freight operators and infrastructure managers' wants and needs where it comes to really understanding how we can improve a number of different areas for, on the network to improve that freight access. We're looking at route access for heavier, longer and larger freight, increased average maximum freight speeds, safe freight maintenance and operations, and as well thinking about how do we decarbonize our freight traction. The program itself was set up in 2021, following a request from the freight industry to really deliver a dedicated pipeline of freight research. And I'm happy to say that now we're delivering over two and a half million pounds of research investment, focusing on those four themes that I mentioned. Ralph, next slide, please. What does that investment look like? Well, we've delivered seven projects already. And with the slides that will be shared afterwards, you can click each of these projects and it will take you to the research page and you'll be able to access all of the research at each individual page. As I mentioned, we've delivered seven projects. We've got eight in delivery, of which this is one which is coming to a close shortly, and one in preparation. Uh, Ralph, next slide, please. 
And of course, we're coming up to CP7 and it is important that we continue to react to the freight industry's needs and wants. Uh, there is a formal mechanism to identify and suggest ideas that can form part of the freight programme. But if you have more research needs more widely for the rail industry as a whole, then we also accept those too. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into the meat of the presentation and I'll hand over to Ralph to talk about how we're improving payloads using improved methodologies. Thanks, Aaron, and thank you uh, more broadly to the, the OSSB for supporting the freight, um, the freight industry and what they do. It's fantastic. Um, very simple structure today. Uh, we've just done the introduction, actually. Uh, uh, I, I will add a little bit more to that. We'll go through the findings of what we've had, and hopefully, uh, if I don't run on for too long, we'll have some time, some questions, answers at the end. So, <clears throat> the introduction uh, of this is that um, an idea was put forward for, for research about improving the maximum trading load payload of the train by updating Network Rail's freight trading loads book. Now, the freight trading loads book looks like this, um, this thing here. It's actually a series of Excel spreadsheets where we've got locations on the left-hand side, um, relatively short locations. So this has been Victoria to Hearn Hill in, in South London. You've got a number of different trains and uh, basically what it says to you is that this is the maximum load, the maximum trading load, the trading load limit, TLL, that you can carry on these things. So you can see that if you're going from Victoria to Factory Junction and you're using a class 33, Lord help us, uh, you can pull 1134 tonnes. A 66 will give you 3,030 tonnes. A um, few problems with this. It's out of date. There's, there's nothing beyond the 67, so um, it hasn't been updated this century. Um, and the genesis of it all is a bit lost in the in the mists of time. It comes from this, this wonderful document called MT19, uh, which is the Manual of Maximum Freight Train Loads on Gradients for Various Types of Locomotive. Undated. Um, nobody's actually got a physical copy. Uh, there's only partial copies knocking around. But this was what uh, British Railways did back in the day, which was the science that underpinned all of this. But actually, that's the only thing that we've got, and there's no direct link between these two things. So nobody knows really how, how these numbers were generated. Um, so the scope of the job was to, uh, to, to, to put this back on a proper empirical foot, foot, uh, footing, and it built on previous work that we did on, on coupler strengths. So on the right-hand side, you've got limits that are based on coupler strengths. So this shows how old it is, 23 tonne. There aren't any 23 tonne couplers on the network at the moment. There are a few IKAs of 34 and a half tonne. Uh, and there are some 56 tonne couplers as well. Uh, other work that we've done for the RSSB has now generated a new coupler strength uh, of 63 tonne, which has been fitted to some of the more modern vehicles. So we've got limits based on the type of traction. You've got limits based on the coupler strength. As we went through this, we, we realised that also there was, there was a third limit, which was the amount of time that you've got to, to look, uh, to get through the network, and that's known as your section on running time. And so for a train to be able to operate, it's got to have sufficient tractive effort. Obviously, the couple of strengths have got to be strong enough, and you've got to have an exceptional section on running time. You can't ignore the time dimension of, of the train. You can have a very, very heavy train. Uh, the Mendip Stone train is a great example, which is so slow that it can only run overnight, and that's acceptable. But generally, that's not. So we need to be in that sweet spot. Three legs of the stool, we need to sit right in the middle. So that got added to the scope as we went through this, the opportunity to look at section running types. So I'm going to talk about the work in putting this back together and then do some work on section running types. So there are 10 conclusions, which I've grouped together, and I'm going to go through this. So first of all, it's been possible to back calculate the historic freight trading loads book. That's the Excel sheet I showed you derived from MT19 using four components. Those four components are gravity, curving, acceleration, internal resistances. Let's just talk about that for a second. So what's the locomotive does do? What does the locomotive need to do? Sorry. It needs to do four things. It needs to be able to pull the load up the hill, obviously. It needs to be able to accelerate um, pulling away. Uh, it needs to be able to pull the train around the curves. And it needs to be able to overcome the aerodynamic and internal resistances within the vehicles. So these are the four components 
and now they are the only four components. And it, I guess if you thought about it long enough, you would have got to these four too. And then what we've done is we've put some maths behind it. So gravity works on the train, uh, and you can see as you've got a bit of a physics background, there's, there's, there's just a symbol, symbol sort of um, thing that the force required is the, the, is the angle and angle plus whatever the train weight is. Uh, and then there's an accelerative force. Uh, and we put some uh, details on what the train acceleration is that 25 centimeters squared is, is what's used and, and that's that's a fairly industry standard. And then we go through for the locomotive and the wagons, the mechanical, the internal resistances and the reserve, the reserve, the forces to, to pull the wagon, uh, the train round the, the curves. Interestingly, you can see that the the uh, the rolling resistances have a, a component which has got a squared relationship with speed, uh, and so they become much larger as speed comes up. Part of this, going back to the conclusions, was that further work needs to be done to update some of the force coefficients in here. So there are lots of numbers down here uh, and there are lots of numbers beneath this it's actually another level of detail and um, none of this has been looked at properly for 30 years and so there's an area for future research there in the future to to improve that uh, and indeed as we've gone through this process and over, over, over turned over a few stones we, we, we've found an awful lot of that and we've defined two load cases starting tractive effort and rolling tractive effort so at starting tractive effort down the bottom here, we have high acceleration, okay? We're getting the train moving. So we're, we're applying this, this, this load and that's significant. However, in rolling tractive effort, we're at line speed. So there's no acceleration required. So there's a big difference. Starting tractive effort, obviously starting rolling, you've got that movement, you're okay. At starting in turn, uh, 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 you've got a very low speed. So actually, your mechanical forces are very, very low. Uh, however, when you're moving, it's the opposite. You've got high internal forces. So you can see that there's a trade-off, starting tractive effort and rolling tractive effort. Historically, everybody said that starting tractive effort is a really important thing. Um, and you've got to be able to move the train in the first instance. And generally, uh, rolling tractive effort gets taken care of. But we'll see it's a bit more nuanced than that. There's also... a historically a continuous load case or sometimes called a one hour continuous loading case which theoretically back in the day was British Rail saying well actually we can withstand this force for an hour before before everything gets cooked on board the locomotive we we now no, no longer think that that's relevant or helpful uh, we think that uh, things have moved on and we're better just to consider that these two load cases are starting and rolling tractive effort so this is a huge huge step forward and we've been able to put numbers in and apply them to the, the tractive effort that's available from the locomotives. And we've been able to back calculate these numbers and validate them uh, and see some of the shortcuts that happened in the, in the way by British Railways. But, but yeah, it's really good. So now we've got a proper empirical basis to calculating uh, tractive effort and payload. Um, we've come up from this with half a dozen areas where um, more research would be helpful. Uh, we could do with better locomotive tractive effort. When we move forward, we've, we, we've been able to obtain tractive effort um, where, where the tractive effort, available tractive effort has been def, uh, defined at one mile hour increments. We haven't got that for every traction type. Um, there's a little bit of work about railhead adhesion and the effect of the coefficient of friction. Um, there's a lot of evidence that the first wheel set that goes over the, uh, over the rail improves the railhead adhesion the following rail sets and so we take this forward this needs to do a little bit more robustly for the consideration of the, the effective friction allowances for four and six axle locomotives um also it's not properly empirically understood the effectiveness of modern wheel slip protection sanding and other methods of improving railhead adhesion and i'll come back to this this issue around railhead adhesion and why it's so important and finally, we need to consider how track construction and orientation affects railhead adhesion as well. So there's a bit of stuff on, on railhead adhesion. Um, we believe that some of the locomotive internal resistance state so is quite old and doesn't reflect developments such as low track fault bogies or light attraction matters. So a lot of the stuff that's out there is old and could do with updating. 
And similarly, some of the stuff on the wagon internal resistances could do with updating, um, particularly for the two axle wagons, although there aren't many of those left in the network, but they are overly conservative. And finally, uh, track characteristics. We we think that that's not properly thought through how that that um, affects the wagon internal resistances. Network rail, sorry, British Rail had two level types of track. They had primary and secondary, and, and secondary is kind of freight only. That's how we've chosen to define it, which is um, you know it's not continuously welded track, um, and possibly the the orientation of the track isn't always maintained so well. So that might affect it. So there's uh, some stuff that's come out of this. So the fourth conclusion is sorry, let me just make sure I've yeah, I've cleared all those three. So using it, we've been able to now do some modeling. So using initially an Excel model, um, and then moving to a statistical package called R, it's an open source package. Um, we've been able to calculate the running times of trains and the trading load as they go over various bits of geography. So I start with the Excel model here, which some of you may or may not seen from from different um, conversations we've had about this. This Excel model allows us to put in all kinds of different traction, including last ninety nines and ninety threes, um, and um, we can put in various consists. It doesn't have to be the same wagon type, um, and we can put in the route data. Now, putting the route data is really powerful because it means that we can put in um, very short sections of track. Uh, and this is a, a particular, um, particularly uh, challenging piece of geography where we've got a sawtooth. We've got a, a very steep gradient of one in a hundred and, and it drops. And then there's another very steep gradient followed by a fairly steep gradient. Um, and, but these are very short. You can see here the horizontal curve, sorry, the, the segment length 32 meters, 10 meters, 194 meters. So these are very short pieces of track. Now, previously, this maximum gradient would have implied the whole train. But we can see here that this, this worst case scenario, if we just ignore that little drop for 10 metres, 32 metres plus 194 metres, you know, we're talking about applying it to half a train length. And so, therefore, we're able to apply greater granularity and get better answers. So that is a very specific manual workaround. You need to know where the worst case scenario is. And we needed more computing power to work this more uh, thoroughly. So we moved to R, which is an open source statistical package. And we've used this uh, data to be able to calculate the train running speed. We've also put in the geography. So, so this is uh, our middle and main line case study. Three peaks. Um, I didn't know we had three peaks on the middle and main line. This is running south from Leicester, which is the junction down to Bedford. And it's the most uh, challenging piece of geography. Um, not super super terrible, but there's a there's a few hills here, and um, and this line here is a performance of a class sixty six, and so you can see the class sixty six, which is entering at, at, at line speed, slows down a bit, recovers, slows down a lot, recovers, slows down, blah 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 blah, uh, and actually we've modelled it for class ninety nine, and she doesn't even see the hills, she just goes straight over. So now we've taken this and we can model properly sectional running times for all of these vehicles. And uh, this is a 2000 ton train. And we're now beginning to get into the conversation about what the sectional running times are. So um, I'll come back to that. But I guess the point from this conclusion is that we've now developed models which are available from the RSSB, an Excel model and an R model. The next point is about rail-headed adhesion or, or friction. It's the same thing. So these are the tractive effort curves for locomotives. Um, and locomotives, uh, if I take the class 66, which is the, uh, what is the class 60? Uh, oh, it's, it's brown one, the brown one. So all diesel locomotives uh, have a tractive effort, which falls away quite quickly with speed. So you can see here, they can get up to about 10 miles an hour. And then everything gets hot and starts getting a bit clunky and the speed runs away. So by the time you're at, at down at sort of 50 miles an hour, you're at, you've only got 25% of your peak power. Uh, and you can see the various curves. Now, this is the power that's available, but there is another constraint, which is the friction that you've got. And if you've got, um, if you haven't got sufficient friction, your wheel will slip and you'll get wheel slip. 
And so when we calculate this, or when Network Rail have calculated this in the past, they've taken um, a figure for the coefficient of friction of 0.33, known as mu. So the coefficient of friction is uh, basically the is a, is a number that you multiply the force by to, to give you a limit on the amount, amount of force you've got. So you've, if you've got a force you apply at the railhead, uh, which is coming from the locomotive, it's limited by this coefficient of friction. And you can see here that historic figure has been a third. So if your locomotive's got 400 kilonewtons of power, uh, actually you can only apply 100 kilonewtons, uh, sorry, 130 kilonewtons at the railhead to actually move the train along. So a large part of, of what we've done is just to, to consider whether this, this value of mu, the coefficient of friction, is still relative, is still real. And stuff has changed since this, this has come along. Specifically, we've got better traction electronics. Um, we've got a better way of managing the load that goes there. And we've got better sounding. Uh, we've got six axle vehicles. We've got AC traction motors. Uh, and the rest of the world has moved on. It's fair to say we're, we're, we're quite a long way behind the rest of the world. Um, in Australia, nice dry track. They're taking figures of over 0.4 certain circumstances um, and the Europeans are generally up to 0.36 or 0.38 and, and we've actually proposed a whole series of revised coefficient of friction, uh, coefficient of friction figures um, for various locomotives depending on their number of axles they've got and their traction and types and all that kind of stuff so unfortunately no changes for the 66 themselves they've got a relatively old traction package and uh, the 66.6 the low geared ones have a slight increase but the 60, um, we're suggesting, has a 0.36 uh, maximum uh, coefficient of friction. And so from 0.33 to 0.36 is about a 10% increase, 9% increase. So that's worth having. That's that's a big deal. With the class 70s, we're suggesting uh, it could go to 0.38, a 15% increase. So that's really powerful. Really powerful. 15% extra. You know, actually, what's happening is we're moving up this line here. So this is the class 70 line here at the top. We've also been able to, to throw it forward for some of the, 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 the more recent traction that's coming out, the 88s, the 90s, the 92s, 93s, 99s, and that's quite helpful. What's interesting is that, that some of these vehicles are not quite so heavy, so the 93s is 88 tonnes and the 99s 113 tonnes, and so provisionally, uh, and so they wouldn't be as powerful because they're not so heavy. It's the, the weight that, that limits the coefficient of friction. Sorry. And so the class 99 will have roughly the power of a class 60 at the moment in terms of starting tractive effort. Um, because we're able to give it to 0.38. If it wasn't if it 0.33, you know, we'd be taking 20% of this off and we'd be back at 3, 350 or something, 360, 40. So there's that thing about brown head adhesion, which is really, really important. And I think. Also, uh, in the back of everybody's mind will be the fact that actually uh, we have uh, a lot of problems this time of year with railhead adhesion, and we think that there's something about having winter training loads or, or autumnal training loads and normal training loads. And, and actually, in, in areas where there are known to be problems with railhead adhesion, that that's taken in as part of the planning process. The second point that we take from this, so the same graph, is the fact that actually electric locomotives have considerably more power uh, at line speed, around a third, a three times as much. They hold their initial tractive effort for a lot longer, and then the rate of decay well, is a similar shape curve, but actually it's much more elevated. So at 30 or 40 or 50 miles an hour, generally you've got three times as much power available with an electric locomotive than you have with a diesel locomotive. So another one of our case studies that we've done is, is SHAP. So this brown line is, is, is the SHAP uh, gradients. First of all, you've got a bit of a steep hill, get up to Grey Rig, and a bit of flat stuff. And then you go again, and you go right up, and the worst gradient's up to SHAP. So this is West Coast Main Line going through Lake Street. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at the diesel locomotives, uh, we're assuming they're, open, they're, they're entering at a line speed of... Um, 75 miles an hour. And they're actually getting a bit of a hammering going up Grey Rig. And, and they're getting to about 30, 35 miles an hour, depending on what, what you're out. However, they're able to recover. 
not quite to line speed, but they get up to sort of 60, 65. And then suddenly they hit the gradient again and quite soon they go right the way down. And so with this, I think it's 1,200 tonne train, the class 66 pulls over the top at around 20, 25 miles an hour. If we model two class 90s, they don't see the hills. They, they more or less maintain line speed all the way across. Um, there's eight axles and a pair of class 90s. But even so, the fact that they've got this much more power means that they just keep banging all the way through and don't slow down at all. And so you can see the massive difference this has on, on running time. You know, actually, these vehicles here are running at 75, whereas these vehicles are running at 35. So a big, big deal. This really shows the benefit of electric traction. And I guess this is the business case for class 93s and 99s um, when they perform like this. And, and, and the class 88s, which are only a, a four axle hybrid locomotive, um, you can see even, you know, even those are maintaining a sort of 50 mile an hour as they go up. So this is very telling. And so now we're coming into this, this area of, of um, of rolling tractive effort. You can see here that they're much better in the rolling tractive effort. Um, uh, and and that's something to warn in mind. Sometimes electric locos, as we've spoken about previously, the 99s uh, have a have a, a starting tractive effort equivalent to, to the um, 66s. So that's okay, but some of the others will be a bit lower. So they struggle with, with starting tractive effort. So you've just got to look at them both low cases when you take this into consideration. But generally, for marching up the hills, electric traction is a much, much better option. Um, and so this 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 graph, uh, ignore the dotted lines a little bit, but it tells you the, the time it takes to go up SHAP with various loads. Um, and the Pendolinos, the Class 390 passenger vehicles, can go up there in about 13 minutes. Um, and actually, a pair of 90s really has a very, very similar time uh, and this is this is you know this is um oh get me this is a a 17 mile run here so it's a long long distance the distance between the 90s and the and, and the three uh, and the pendolinos is just the, the line speed they can run at the pendolinos can go faster whereas the 390s uh sorry the 290s are capped at 75 miles an hour the 99 is very very similar uh, but you can see as the heavy attraction comes along we're moving from a sort of 20, uh, sort of 15 minute run time up to 40 or over 50 minutes for the class 66 at these very very heavy loads that you never get permission to run at and so what happens is that because of your sectional running time the class 66 is pegged back to a, a load of, of 1400 tons here and so this is we begin to see now the effect of sectional running time where although the 66 could get up there nobody can wait an hour for them to get there and so what happens is that it all gets pegged back uh, so that they can get up the hill in a sensible -ish time of 25 minutes. And that means they can only run with uh, sort of 1,200 tons, sorry, 1,200 tons. However, generally across the four case studies, we've seen the historic section wind times appear conservative. And generally, at least a 10% improvement is po possible. For the modern electric locomotives, section wind teams need to be established, which take account of the significantly improved rolling tractive effort. And so at the moment, there aren't any section running times for these new vehicles. And I know that the, the relevant FOCs are thinking about this and they're critical because you can see here that, that, that these vehicles should have much, much better section running times. And the last thing you want to do is read across from a class 66 and apply it to a class that's 99. It's a disaster. You don't need to do that and you're wasting your locomotive. Um, the last substantive conclusion is that SRT allowances appear to reflect operation constraints of working around the passenger timetable in mixed use applications, where sometimes the freight trains are given a longer than required running time to avoid conflict with passenger vehicles. So you can kind of understand that. However, when the passenger train is not running, the, the, the running time allowances are unchanged, unnecessarily slowing the freight trains, increasing their fuel and usage. So this is a West London line case study. So this is uh, running north from Clapham Junction, uh, crossing Chelsea Bridge, and chugging up to, to Willesden to Martin Bridge Junction. So these are the SRTs for, um, now I should know, I think it's a 2000 tonne class 66. 
Um, from Latchmere Junction to West Brompton, four minutes. West Brompton to Kenny Oak, three minutes. You can see. And so you've got a total through running time of 12 minutes. When we model this, we get very different numbers. Um, for the larger in one case, uh, but everywhere else, very shorter. So you can see we're comparing 12 minutes with really seven minutes. And particularly in these areas here, there's a big, big difference. The, 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 dis the distance between these, these two stations is about one and a half kilometers. Uh, and this is flat. Um, and, you know, I could almost walk it in one well, hour. No, no exaggeration, I'll stop that. But, but actually, it's very, very close. And so there's no way you need three minutes. However, the local passenger services, because they stop, need three minutes for their platform dwell time. And so the conclusion here is that, that actually the, the section running times for the freight trains are being limited by the, the available time that the passenger trains need to avoid conflict, because clearly you can never come through, you just bump up against these things. So that's understandable, I guess. But there is this point about this is the only section of running time for freight trains on this piece of infrastructure. And so the, you know, in the early morning when these trains don't run, you're still running to these, these silly little section of running times. And um, you could go much faster through there. Uh, and the what that means is effectively you could almost get two freight trains through the pathing allowance where there is one. So this is a really important point because West London line. Uh, moving northbound is a, is a real bottleneck from freight from South London wanting to go north. Not only can you increase network capacity through this, but you can actually improve the, the, the trailing load. And we've done various, uh, uh, we've looked at various scenarios here of, of how this train runs. We've got the class 66 running through seven minutes, 2,100 tons. So they go, that was lucky, wasn't that? I was right. Uh, and you can see that actually, even if you have 2,700 tons, it only takes less than eight minutes. So theoretically, a uh, uh, class 66, if it's allowed to run, which is another important constraint, would get through this, it smashed the section of running time. There would be no problem at all. And we can get much longer trains. There's a particular issue on this section of, of line that, 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 that there is a severe gradient at the end of the track. And that would rather very concerned if the train stops at, um, at Shepherd's Bush or somewhere like that, then it won't be able to get up the hill. And that's true. But if the train approaches with any kind of momentum, then it will get up the hill. And so there's a little bit of a mindset thing there to, to talk to Network Rail about, about letting the freight trains through. And if that's the case, then suddenly we can run with much longer trains. You know, we've got two, 2,700 tonnes here and we stopped. But you can see that 3,000 tonnes, you can go 4,000 tonnes if you wanted to be crazy. Um, you can get through this. Uh, and and with a 99, it, it's a, this piece of track is not electrified, but, but it, this is to show the difference between electric and, and um, diesel uh, traction. You know, the running times are, 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 are better again, uh, just because of improved characteristics going on last section. You know, and this is a, only a very short piece of track here. Um, I should know, it's probably about six miles, seven miles. It's not very far at all. Um, but it's a really important choke point and worthy of special consideration. And it pulls out this thing about the operational constraints of working around the passenger transports. And so, you know, one of the suggestions we're making is that, that actually you could have a maximum training load, which could vary with the, the tirings. So at the moment, actually, the, 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 the maximum load is 2,000 tonnes. But at night time, you could go over 2,700 tonnes is the, the point that we're making. So that's interesting. Uh, the, the last two questions are around implementation. Um, uh, I guess the first point is just to say that network rail are, are key to the implementation of this. And, and I personally take every opportunity I possibly can to speak to network rail and make sure as many people as possible are aware of this. Um, at the moment, the, the, the freight training loads book is, is a bit of a clunky thing. Um, and nobody really looks at it. People know where the choke points are, are and just apply it at that point. Um, but network rail are subject to funding constraints, looking to move that into a digital thing, which is a great thing. But actually the digitization of the freight train loads is really no more than, than taking the existing uh, Excel spreadsheets and putting them into a digital format. And what we would propose is that, that, that this algorithm, this, this formula, oops, sits behind all of this so you can have a much more dynamic 
uh, approach to calculating uh, both train load limits and, and section on wind times. Um, sorry, just get back to where I was. Um, also, um, we we consider that um, junction to junction tables are helpful. So what happens here, part of the issue here, is that the network rail systems will only work in 30 second increments. And so everything gets um, either pushed up or pushed down as appropriate. And, and sometimes it gets rounded down, but often it gets put, rounded up. And so, you know, this case here, zero minutes, 45 seconds would, would absolutely get rounded up to one minute. Now, actually what we're suggesting is that you round up the junction to junction. So you round this seven minutes, 10 seconds to either seven minutes or eight minutes, rather than round this, round this, round this, round this, and add all the increments together, because it always generally works out worse freight. And actually there's no need to do that. You could just do it on a junction to junction basis. That's a very small thing. Um, however, you know, we can't do that on a specific basis. This will need changes to network rail systems. Um, the TPS system and the TU system, and that in itself will require funding. And there's a training need that will come out of this. So this is, you know, I can talk glibly about here how easy it is to do, but actually the, the reality of this is that, that it needs, you need systems changes which need funding and then there's a training need. So th there's a big change to this. And, and in the short term, we will just have to look at this in a pinch point location and we use a service plan review process to go through this. Uh, so, you know, we, I mean, I personally am using this sort of this sort of data as a basis of a service plan review. One of the interesting things here in the in, in the in the middle of the main line uh, case study is the section of two track and a section of four track. So, so the most, most northerly section of it is two track. And then you get to four track where you've got much more space from a timetable point of view. So actually, if you can get through this uh, and get to Kettering or wherever it is where there's four track, then there's another nuance here. If you can use this stuff to prove that you can get to here without avoiding uh, get the passenger, the fast passenger train behind you, then you, you're on your way. Um, and so that's that's the um, that's the implementation piece. We've looked at the benefit. We've done a flow specific. The benefit of um, increasing the payload of the trains, how that would affect the cost per ton, the savings that you would get. You know some of these um some of these big domestic intermodal trains you know talking about possibly saving two thousand pounds a train um and then we've applied that to like 20 percent of the trains or something like that and we've come up with a figure of 50 million pounds highly subjective of that but it's a big number you know it's a big number uh, and this is with you forever forever and so you know this is a big deal so these are the, the main conclusions that i've talked through um uh, and then um, the final thing is to say that we network, uh, sorry, RSSB have um, provided some additional funding uh, to do a deep dive analysis to key locations. Um, and so we're going to have a follow on project called T1301, uh, which is going to allow us to actually look at specific locations where the freight industry feels that it's a problem. So we might choose to go a bit deeper into the West London line. Or, or we might choose to go somewhere else, Liverpool or Manchester or wherever people think, uh, and apply this R technology and the model to really demonstrate the case. And the get involved piece is the fact that we will be coming out for some consultation about where the best places are to, to look at this kind of stuff. So uh, that's that. Questions and answers. I hope I'm not too bad with time. Um, Maggie, do you want to step back? Will you run this? Thanks, Ralph. Aaron, did you want to add anything? Only to repeat Ralph's uh, call to action for people who are watching today, and that really is do please get in contact with us. We're really keen to understand where your pinch points are and where we think this piece of work can really provide the best benefit for industry. Lovely. And that's how to get in contact um, if you want further discussions, either you, myself or, or Aaron. And uh, Maggie has these points or... You can ask for the pack, but but those are our email addresses. And if you've got any comments or any observations, then we'd be delighted to hear from you. Thank you, Ralph. Thank Maggie. you. Aaron. I mean, a phenomenal piece of work there. And I think what's really interesting, you know, is that we 
well, the opportunity that continues to present itself from just taking stuff that nobody's looked at for decades and looking at it. Um, you know, and I know we're all guilty of uh, continuing to do things the way we've always done them in the past, you know, whether that's our personal filing or or, or actually work things, but it is a, a constant reminder of the need to keep the standards that we run the railways on updated. And I think that that is, you know, is the headline is that uh, people who are listening, please do come in with your questions. Uh, but a few from me before we start. Ralph, on, on a lot of the charts, you've taken railway geography, you know, the gradients and such like Is that digitised now? Or are you having to scramble around, low, you know, gradient profile books? No, no. Um, yeah, well, Ralph moved a long way here. And, and I think, mate, just to be congratulated, that, that there are gradients and curvature data available. Right, so, so you can in effect take a digital profile of the network and use that against the models that you've created. Yeah, and, and I think I should um, uh, also mention Ether that have been um, principal subconsultants in this, and Ether have developed their model uh, to to do this. And, and so uh, for each, we've, we've done four case studies: um, middle and mainline, uh, the Shap, uh, the West Coast mainline, and. Um, What's the fourth one? Condra. Anyway, there's four locations where we've um, we've actually where Ether of model geography using network rails data, and it's been really really helpful. And part of the the T the next piece of work is is there anywhere else that we want to model to have a look at? Okay, but if if where people are interested in modelling that that data would be available and they'd be able you'd be able to get your hands. Yes. On. So you know, actually, specifically, I'm, I'm working on a bitumen train that that goes up Copped Oak, which is um, in Yorkshire, and, and, and that's a real pinch point at the moment, and yep. so that's something that I personally want to suggest. Okay, uh, and again, second one from me, whilst in case any more come in, but um, there are a number of places here where a very sensible conclusion is that not everything is the same all the time, so certain things could be different at day in the day or overnight, certain things could be different at different times of year. How how capable are the timetabling systems of accommodating that? Well, um, I think at one level they're capable of adopting it uh, in that, um, so, so, so in these timetabling systems, you have section of running times uh, that run between tip blocks. And already there are multiple sectional running times for each type of traction and each type of weight based on whether they're through running or whether they're stopping. So there are, before uh, low conditions, you can keep running all the way through, which is run, run. You can run to a stop. You can stop to a run or you can stop to a stop. And so each one of those four flavours has a different sectional running times and they're already created. What's we're proposing here is is effectively um, more options where you've got a peak or off peak variants of those things. So that could be put into a tune or T a TPS. Um, it would just need uh, some kind of check to make sure that the um, the right one is chosen. Um, and we're we're certainly going to create a lot more SRTs, and so we should. And that's why we have computers, uh, mm. but it, it's a you know there's a, there's a data thing there as well, uh, and this is part of why network rail systems might need to get look at, looked at. Yeah, yeah, because it seems to me that that you know particularly your points about overnight, you know, are are interesting because it, you know it, obviously one wants to run a symmetrical train out and back, and so there are some operational constraints. But even if by improving SRTs, we just get a quicker run with the same trailing load. There's still a productivity gain to be had or a customer gain in getting that train there at a better time. Um, and the, presumably, um, you know, some performance benefits to be having if we're adding the trailing loads where we can do that as well, even more so. So that would seem to me to be, you know, a fair, you know, I suppose our version of peak and off peak, really, a fairly obvious switch to try and get pulled. It's a big deal, Maggie. Um, I mean, actually, um, particularly for, for northbound loaded trains. Um, so uh, the jet fuel train off, off either Grand Heathrow or uh, a lot of the aggregate trains that run out of Angostin to, to the northern terminals, they're returning empty. Uh, and so, 
you know, a th if you had a 30 wagon train, that you know, there are only 1500 tons less than that running running south. And so there's no problem running south, it's just running north. Right. And so you, you could put a 3000 ton train up the hill in the middle of the night and she'll run back as, as fast as you like coming back. Perfect. So, that so there's, there's ma massive benefits there. You know, I think that the Angersteen track in particular is is really attractive to this. I mean, the, the, the jet fuel track train is a bit complicated because it does multiple locations and multiple rotations during the day. But, um, you know, everybody's a winner here. It's it's cheaper for, for Tarmac or whoever it is that are running off Angersteen. Network rail, you're suddenly getting 50% less freight trains because they're 50% longer. And um, so you've got network capacity benefits, you've got reliability capacity, reliability benefits because there aren't freight trains in the way. Everybody's a winner here. Yeah, yeah, I can see that, absolutely. And then all autumn, because I know this is, um, yeah, you know, it's sort of a sensible conclusion, but I know from speaking to customers where their trains get downgraded in the autumn, it's a real frustration because, of course, particularly on the bulk side, it's a busy time of the year and, you know, for building. And so how do how do we square off that that sort of reputational point, I suppose, about, oh, it's autumn, so you train shorter? Well, I think it's about communication, Maggie. I mean, I, I think there's a couple of things out of here. The, the first thing is that actually perhaps Network Rail need a greater awareness of, of this issue with freight trains. Uh, um, that, that kind of goes without saying and should be addressed already. But I think... We're not going to get away from the fact that coefficient of friction decreases in, in autumn. And I think the customers have frankly got to be aware that they won't be able to run super long trains uh, in autumn. And it, that's a communication thing. In my experience, um, people don't like surprises. But if you tell them up in advance what's going on, we can do this train over extension. However, for two or three months, we've got to go back to the standard flow. Then at least they know and they can plan and they know what's going on. And uh, I think that's the answer to that. It's when it happens, you know, very short, you know, short timescales that people have a big problem because they put it in their budgets and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, okay, love it. Uh, right, a couple of questions coming in. Uh, one from Lee. Really interesting project, close to my heart. Is there any consideration in calculations for, for prevailing weather conditions on gradients and levels, i.e. effective headwind on freight trains or areas with known adhesion issues? Um, no. Um, is a short answer, Lee. I think it's a really good question, but but actually, being able to look at headwinds and tailwinds would uh, would be very complicated. I, I guess aerodynamics are a big deal, um, and uh, so I guess should be taken into consideration. But you know, the truth of the matter is that's so variable on a day by day basis. I don't know that we could use that. Because you definitely have to look at the weather forecast every day to to make sure that you know you're optimizing your train, and that's not going to work from a practical level. So no, we haven't looked at uh, uh, at weather conditions. I think weather is taken this condition. Weather sometimes is taken into consideration with adhesion, um, in so much as they look at you know the possibility of um, leaf fall. But again, um, I think that's still in development. So we don't. The, the short answer is no, we don't. Um, one of the very interesting things that came out of this is, uh, and I haven't put the slide up, but um, the aerodynamic loadings on, on on empty box wagons are significant, and empty hopper wagons as well. So that you get to the point where the aerodynamic loading on uh, 50 or 60 miles on an empty wagon makes it almost as, uh, as heavy, so to speak, requires much force as a fully loaded wagon. Because effectively, if you're running... 20 or 25 boxes that are empty, you, you're effectively pulling 25 air brakes behind you. And it's a big deal at high speed. There's a uh, case there for sheeting. Is... Sorry, I was going to say there's a case there for sheeting the wagons. I, I, I think you know, when I've got a few, few more minutes, I'll go and talk to a sheeting manufacturer because I think there's a business case, a bit like HGVs get sheeted. Um, there's, a, there's a case for sheeting uh, box wagons. Aaron, am I right in thinking that RS has been doing some work on aerodynamics? We are indeed, yeah. We're looking at how that might impact acceleration and maximum speeds. Uh, we're hoping that some of that those findings could be further input into the model to um, to kind of refine the, the outputs even further. Yeah, thank you. Okay, a question from Fraser. Has any work been done to validate the model's results with existing traction and trailing loads to account for variability in driving styles, etc.? Um, 
Well, so uh, in terms of validation, uh, we validated the the information in two ways. We validated it against the freight train loads book in the first instance to make sure that that's consistent, uh, and we did, and that was a big deal. Uh, and you know, you could say, well, that's if the, if that was wrong, it would have already been challenged. Um, and we've also validated it against uh, some trains by looking at their actual running time and making sure that that's okay. So that's a validation we've had. Um, I think one of the things that's been, been been raised as we've gone down this journey is the fact that that, that because of defensive driving, um, uh, trains are are drivers are taught to drive in a different way. And, and I wouldn't claim to be an expert in this area by any manner of means. Uh, and that defensive driving uh, um, approach means that often you takes a little bit longer and you approach signals more cautiously. And, and I'm sure that's the right thing to do. Like I say, I'm not an expert in this this field. So, um, so that's as far as we've gone. Um, I think it's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure it will make that much difference. But I think that um, I think it's a really interesting thing about how we train our drivers and give them information. Um, because it's one thing to do it model it that's another thing to do in a dynamic railway where everything's either early or late and i think this this information about driver giving the drivers information beyond just the signal they've seen to enable them to run in a more efficient way is a real opportunity um and um but that's not part of what we're doing here no understood and, and i think we're, we're always going to have variabilities of drivers and weather and and what we're trying to do is find the safe place to set the SRTs representing the modern traction and the, the modern dynamics, uh, allowing for the fact that that variability will always be there to some degree. Uh, right, one one more question come in. A great presentation. Also, any further validation on starting and rolling resistance values for wagons and locos? Does the model still use MT19 values? Uh, where appropriate, we do. Um, we we haven't taken them at face value. We we we've gone away, and we've looked at European best practice, and we've looked at also information from the LEMs, uh, and we've chosen the the most appropriate information there. Um, but we have flagged up some areas where f- further research is required that I've I've discussed earlier. Okay. Lovely. Well, if there are no further questions, um, it just uh, falls for me to say thank you both for a, what is, an, you know, a very interesting piece of research, which I think, you know, the pressure as always now is to make sure that we get it into implementation and that we move forward into, uh, you know, the next phase of the deep dives, so hopefully some service plan reviews from that and in parallels, you know, pressure to get this embedded into those network rail systems in the way that we've spoken about, particularly perhaps with that overnight versus daytime, uh, some of those other characteristics, plus, of course, uh, the very necessary work for new locomotives uh, that may be arriving on these shores uh, before too long. Uh, So can I thank uh, both Ralph and Aaron for their time today, uh, for their work on this programme, Uh, Please do get in touch if you want a copy of the slides. I'm sure plenty of people do. And if you want any further information, if you don't have Ralph and Aaron's emails, uh, they're on the slides or we can give them to you directly. Uh, Thank you all very, very much for your time this morning and for listening in. Uh, It'll be up on YouTube by the end of the week. So uh, please do uh, share the news. And if you've got any deep dive examples that you think would be really good to take into that next phase, uh, please go direct to, to Aaron or Ralph or come through us if, you, if, if that's helpful to you. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day.